Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, welcome to this special webinar entitled Women in Astronomy, Past, Present, and Future. My name is Julie. I will just be doing the introduction. We have a guest speaker today, Christine Speckins, who's just getting things organized in the background, I believe. Um, so welcome everyone who's online with me right now and welcome to everyone who will be watching the recording. I know some of you are familiar with Discovered Universe. I know some of you are not. So I'll just take a minute to introduce um, the program. Um, so Discovered Universe, oh, sorry, this is looking kind of weird. Sometimes it does weird things in Adobe Connect. <laughs> but Discovered Universe is an astronomy training program for teachers and and from all educators, so educators on the larger sense. Um, and we started doing that if, actually eight years ago in Canada. Um, we do everything in French and English, and most of our programs are, actually the vast majority of our program is offered online. Um, so you can attend for free anywhere in Canada, but actually we have people from around the world following us as well. So if you are following us, actually if you are, um, if you wanna share in the chat where you're from, we'd be happy to see uh, where um, you are. So welcome everyone, and I'm glad you could be with us. I just want to um, thank our sponsors, or the ones who make this program possible for free, uh, especially the Dunlap Institute at the University of Toronto, the Canadian Astronomical Society, which is the Association of Researchers in Astronomy across Canada, and the Centre for Research of Astrophysics in Quebec as well. Um, but like I mentioned, everything is offered in both languages, and on Thursday, Christine will be offering the same webinar in French. If some of you are interested, you can just go to the French part of our website and register for it to get the link. A few words about our upcoming workshops in January, and the registrations for this one are open already. Uh, we'll have a webinar called Teaching and Observing Eclipses. Uh, there will be a lunar eclipse, a total lunar eclipse visible everywhere across Canada, actually across all of America. Um, on January 20th, on the evening of the 20th. Um, so it's the 20th here, but if you look online, it's gonna say 21st because it's 21st on sort of universal time. But for us, it's gonna be the evening of the 20th and we'll teach you how to observe it. Uh, we'll help you know how to observe it, but also give you tips on how to teach eclipses. So if you wanna talk about the eclipse to your students or your groups, wherever you are, um, then this might be a good webinar to attend. As always, the recording will be provided if you can't be there live, so no worries um, if you can't, you know, if you have something during that day. And soon we will open registrations for our workshop for teachers, level one. Um, this is something we've been repeating for a few years, but level one is mostly for elementary school teachers. And uh, it's, it lasts, it's over three weeks, one webinar a week for three weeks and kind of build the content. So if you are interested, registrations will open soon, but you should get the information by um, email anyway. So that's what's coming and we'll have many more. Actually, I just didn't have time to put everything there, but the pages will be up and are ready uh, soon. We'll have many more webinars. We're doing that. We're planning the new year and that's always an exciting time for me. So hopefully you know our website because you went there to register, but in case you got the link to the recording, feel free to check out what we offer. We're also on social media. Sometimes we post videos on YouTube, not many, but we tried once in a while. And like I said, we're offered in both English and French. So that's all I have to say about Discovery Universe. Today we have a guest speaker and I'm very happy that she could come with us um, because we've talked about this webinar for at least a year and a half. I think we we're supposed to do the last year, never happened. So this year we made sure it would happen. So Christine Speckens is an astronomer uh, from Ontario. She's uh, a researcher, but she's also very involved with the um, Canadian Astronomical Society. She's on the board of directors. She's also on the, I'm sorry, I might not get the, the, the diversity committee, I believe. Anyway, she'll tell you more about it. I might not get the title completely right. Um, but um, she's uh, very involved in different programs and I thought it would be great for her to come and talk to you about the, the subject of women in astronomy from the past, present and future. So Kristen, I believe you're there, but we still can't see you, unfortunately. Hi, yeah, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Yeah, I've I've tried a few things. For some reason, my webcam has decided that uh, none of you should see me, um, despite the fact that uh, this worked uh, yesterday. Um, so I guess if it's okay with you, Julie, we'll go with voice only. I guess we have to. <laughs> At least we have okay. a picture of you, so people will be able to imagine what you look like throughout the, the webinar. So sorry, everyone, but that's technology, and sometimes we have to work with that. So I will be in the background if some of you have questions. But again, Kristen will be able to look at the chat. 
but if there are some pro technical problems, I'll be in the background as well. But thank you, Kristen, for accepting to, to be there. And uh, now it's up to you. Wonderful. Thanks, Julie. Um, so as Julie mentioned, I'll, I'll show you a, a picture of myself in short order. I think that, in fact, I think that's the first thing that I'm going to show you. Um, so today we're, we're talking about issues that, that um, affect um, diversity and um, inclusivity and equity in astronomy. And for those conversations in particular, it's, it's important to know um, the, the perspective from which people come. So more so than other talks, I thought it was important for me to introduce myself to you a little bit. Um, so the picture that you see on this slide is actually me in the field in Australia a couple of weeks ago. Um, I, I promise you that's not where I am right now. I'm in a much more boring location sitting in my office. Um, but I, uh, I hail from uh, Burlington, which um, for people who aren't in Ontario is uh, a, a city near Toronto in Ontario. Um, I obtained my bachelor's degree in physics at Queen Univers Queen's University in Ontario and then uh, moved to the U.S. to obtain my Ph.D. in astronomy from Cornell University, and that's in upstate New York. Um, so I was a, a researcher for a couple of years and then returned uh, to Canada at both the Royal Military College and Queen's University, where I've been since 2008. So my primary appointment is at the Royal Military College, where I teach physics and astronomy at the undergraduate level, and I also supervise graduate students there. Um, a lot of my research funding, as well as my um, uh, a number of my graduate students, also come through Queen's University, so I spend some time there as well. Um, so the picture that you see on the right, as, as I alluded to, is from a, a more exciting place than I'm sitting right now. This is the um, Australian outback. I was there about two and a half weeks ago. It's about 500 kilometers inland from Perth. And this is the site of, or the future site of an exciting new project that's underway internationally called the Square Kilometer Array. Um, so believe it or not, I'm standing next to a telescope or actually a very small part of a prototype telescope that will be used by the Square Kilometer Array. Um, so it looks like a bit of a Christmas tree, and in fact, that's what it is. It's a, it's a fancy dipole that's meant to record low-frequency radio waves. And ultimately, tens of thousands of objects like this will be used um, uh, to construct a very sensitive telescope at those low radio frequencies, among other things, to observe the epoch of reionization, so the time um, <clears throat> when uh, the first stars in the universe ionized uh, some of the hydrogen gas that was present. Um, the two pictures below uh, the picture of myself and the outback illustrate the kind of research that I do. So my interest is in nearby galaxies. So the photo on the left here, let me point to it, um, is a, a false color image of a nearby galaxy. So the pink shows the stars and it's in false color because I wanted to show you the, the blue parts, which is the gas, the atomic hydrogen in these galaxies. And my particular research interest is to use the atomic hydrogen in galaxies to better understand their structure. And we think that that structure comes from the cosmological model that we think describes the structure and evolution in the universe. And that's what's illustrated by the picture on the right. Um, it's a, it's a, basically a picture of the dark matter distribution in the universe on very large scales. So one of the smallest yellow dots that you see in the picture on the left, we think houses a galaxy like the picture shown, or, or sorry, on the, the picture on the right houses a galaxy like um, the picture on the left. Um, so my primary focus uh, in, uh, in addition to teaching is research, um, but I have had, or I do have some interest and have some experience in astronomy policy in Canada. So as Judy mentioned, I'm a member of the Canadian Astronomical Society's Board of Directors. I've been that for three years now. Um, and I'm also a member of the Equity and Inclusivity Committee of the Canadian Astronomical Society. So these are worrying about issues of um, equity, diversity, and inclusion within the Society of Professional Astronomers in Canada. Um, and so this is the, the perspective from which I'm going to talk about women in astronomy today. Um, so I, I'll emphasize that I, I don't do research in the social sciences. I will refer to some of the, that research as we go along. So my perspective is one of a professional astronomer who's worried about these issues. Um, so if you ask a question, uh, per particularly as it pertains to the sociology of um, gender studies, I'll do my best to answer it and I'll try to get you a better answer if uh, that's not satisfactory. Um, but uh, please ask away and I'll, I'll field as many questions as I can. So Judy put together this fabulous montage of 
um, women in various at various stages of history that were um, researchers in astronomy, and it's it's a really inspiring set of pictures to look at. Um, and this, of course, is a, su a small subset of the large number of women who have contributed research in astronomy over the past 100 or 200 years. And of that subset, I'm only going to have time to talk about a, a relatively small number. Um, but before we go ahead and talk about women in astronomy, I, I wanted to think big for a little bit and um, talk about two underlying premises of this presentation. And these premises are, are I'll, I'll take them as givens in this presentation, but they actually have very solid foundations in the field of social sciences. Um, so this is research that's been done over, over a period of decades. Um, and, and they show sort of two key, two key things that I'll use as jumping points or, or starting points for this talk. Um, the first key point that underlies what I'll say today is that astronomy is for everyone. Um, there have been a number of studies that have looked at um, a demographic's innate intellectual ability to do science, to do math, or to do just about anything else. And study after study has shown that that ability doesn't depend on gender or race or some other demographic information. In other words, given equal opportunity, everybody can do astronomy. Um, so what that means is that underrepresentation in astronomy relative to the, the broader population of a, or the broader demographic within society stems from socioeconomic factors. And there are a couple of different ways to, to look at that. The, the first is that um, if we believe that everyone should have an equal opportunity to, to realize their goals and to make a contribution, then underrepresentation is, is, is not ideal. The second way to look at that is that if a certain fraction of the population is equally capable and yet is underrepresented, and if our goal as a society is to explore the universe, then we're underutilizing society's capacity to do that. Um, and so the, the underlying premise of this talk is that um, it, everyone should get a chance to contribute to discovering the universe in proportion to the, to the demographic of the society. And, and the great thing about having underrepresentation stem from socioeconomic factors is that those factors evolve as a function of time. And one of the things that we'll see in this talk is that, in fact, they have evolved over the, over the recent history. And so this can be changed, and therefore the goal is, is to improve the current state of affairs. So the second premise of this talk is that recognizing diversity matters. It's important to point out contributions from diverse members of a given community. Um, and there, there are a couple of reasons for doing that, despite the, the argument that, it, that if everyone is equal, then everyone should be recognized. And, and that is true, but there is some um, justification for making a point of recognizing the contributions of underrepresented members of a given society. And I, and I list a couple of reasons here. And again, this is backed up by research in social sciences. First is that, that those underrepresented members serve as role models. And we know that role models influence career choices, particularly among kids. Um, secondly, we know that people who have personal who, or who make personal connections with diverse members of a, um, of a community, members of a community that might not be like them, um, tend to have reduced biases towards that community. In other words, the more we get to know people, the better we are able to empathize with them and connect with them. And so be, recognizing diverse members of the society is important for that reason. And then finally, studies have shown that diverse workplaces are more creative, they're more productive, they're more satisfying, and they're more satisfying not only for the underrepresented groups, but also for the majority groups as well. So diverse, work, diverse workplaces make for better science. So the last thing that I'll say before launching into this presentation about women in astronomy is that it's really important to keep in mind that all underrepresented groups deserve recognition. And so my focus on, on women in this particular talk is, is not um, to the detriment of, of other underrepresented groups that also should be discussed. It is true, however, that among the other represented groups in academia and particularly in science, women are the only such group for which, um, where the numbers are large enough for statistical analysis to be feasible. And I'm gonna try and rely on some statistics as we go on in this talk, um, both because the, um, it, it's nice to be quantitative when possible, um, and, and that allows us to talk about some more qualitative aspects of this talk. Um, and and um, those kinds of studies are only feasible for women as an underrepresented group right now. So with that in mind, uh, here's the outline of today's talk. Um, I'm going to begin by discussing women in astronomy and particularly drawing examples from the past. 
And the idea with those examples is to give you some, um, for people who are educators out there, to give you some material to work into your own lectures or your own class presentations, um, as well as to highlight the a um, diversity of our early researchers, both in Canada and beyond. Um, from there, we're going to take a break about uh, talking about case studies and instead talk more generally about some factors to consider um, when it comes to underrepresented groups in astronomy and in particular to women. So we'll talk about conscious and unconscious bias. And I'll also give you uh, some numbers that reflect the current state of uh, women in astronomy in Canada today or professional astronomers, I should say, in particular. And then finally, we'll end the presentation with another look at women in astronomy, but this time in the present and this time focused in Canada in particular. And I hope to leave you with the sense that the, the, the future really is bright. Um, and I, I'll only give you a small subset of examples of, of fabulous women in astronomy uh, over the course of history, but hopefully it'll, it'll give you enough of a sense to, to appreciate how far we've come. So we'll start off the lecture by focusing on this first aspect. Let's, let's dive into the past a little bit and talk about women in astronomy. So going back to Julie's montage, you can see that there are some, uh, uh, some pictures from the present and those from the past. And even among those in the past, um, I can only pick a, a couple to focus on. So I'll highlight in red the pictures um, of women that I'll focus on next. And I'll leave it as an exercise for the reader to, um, or for the, the listener to, to piece together which woman is represented by which picture. I've used some of these pictures in the coming slides, but not all of them. Um, so let's start off with um, Annie Jump Cannon. So she lived from 1863 to 1941. Um, this picture here on the top right shows her at work in her lab. Um, and then the picture on the bottom here shows her among many women that uh, worked, uh, had a similar function. Um, and, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so Annie was, Annie's uh, mother at a young age taught her about the constellations using an old textbook. Um, she got a bachelor's degree at Wellesley College in 1884. So Wellesley College is in Massachusetts. Um, she was the valedictorian of her class. And she took um, classes from Sarah Frances Whiting, who was one of the few physicists at the time, um, few female physicists at the time in the US. Um, and after her bachelor's degree, she traveled the world taking, taking photographs. So photography was a relatively new phenomenon at the time. Um, so she returned home to Delaware and became stricken with uh, scarlet fever um, that rendered her nearly deaf and, around, deaf. and around the same time, her mother died, and her mother was one of the, her uh, biggest advocates in her early years. Um, and so after these two events in her life, she, um, Annie Jump Cannon wrote to Sarah Frances Whiting to, at Wellesley College to ask if there was a job opening, and she was hired as a junior physics teacher at the college, and that enabled her to take graduate courses as well. So over the course of her time at teaching at Wellesley, she enrolled in Radcliffe College in Massachusetts, which um, as a special student, and Radcliffe was a women's college that was set up near Harvard University that, so that professors could repeat the lectures that they were giving at Harvard to women, because at the time, uh, Harvard wouldn't grant degrees, uh, advanced degrees to women. Um, so there she met Edward C. Pickering of the Harvard College Observatory and who hired her as a computer. Um, so, or as a, a computer or a cataloger. And so the legend goes at the time that um, Pickering was fed up with his male graduate students uh, in the lab who he believed not to have any skills in cataloging stars. And so to prove a point, he hired his maid who and brought her in to catalog some stars. And she turned out uh, not only to be proficient, but, but actually quite excellent at cataloging stars. And so from then on, Pickering only hired women. So the group, and that's what's pictured in the, the, the picture here at the bottom right. Um, so this, this group of women was tasked with classifying spectra of stars on photographic plates that men would take at the telescopes at uh, Harvard College Observatory during the night. Um, they were known as uh, Pickering's women or Pickering's computers or more derisively Pickering's harem. Um, uh, Annie, among the computers, Annie Jump Cannon was exceptional. She classified more stars in a lifetime than anyone else. So to give you a sense, she classified 350,000 stars in her lifetime. That's a rate of about three per minute. Um, whereas her mentor, the person who hired her, Edward C. Pickering, himself only classified about 10,000. Um, and um, she later uh, credited her, her deafness as a tool for helping her to focus. So, um, Cannon never viewed her deafness as an impediment um, and, um, in fact, credited her success um, with her ability to uh, focus in the quiet. 
Um, so uh, Annie Jump Cannon was recognized later in her life as um, a, for her contributions to astronomy. She received an honorary doctorate, the first honorary first woman to receive an honorary doctorate from Oxford in 1925. And she also created the Annie Jump Cannon Prize of the American Astronomical Society, which rewards exceptional women in the field of astronomy. And that award is still given annually today. So Annie Jump Cannon is uh, her her major contribution to astronomical research comes from classifying stars. So what you can see this this rainbow of color here represents the spectrum of the sun. Um, so for people who haven't seen a spectrum before, each line represents a range of wavelengths, and the, the background color of the line shows that the part of the the optical spectrum um, in which the wavelengths lie. So going from red on the top left of the plot all the way down to blue on the bottom right. And you can see that um, throughout the, this rainbow, you, there, there are a bunch of black notches which represent absorption lines. And those absorption lines come from elements in the atmosphere of the sun. So at the time when Annie Jump Cannon was a computer for Edward Pickering, um, this, the, um, this, this was prior to uh, our understanding of the physics of stars. And so people had started to take spectra of stars, but nobody understood what they meant. Um, and so, uh, in particular, at the time, there were two competing classification schemes for how to understand stars based on their spectra, and one was overly complicated and the other one was overly simple. And what Cannon did is she devised her own method based on the strength of an absorption line in hydrogen. Um, and so she gave um, stars labels A through M based on the strength of that absorption line, and this is the system of classification that we still use today. And so that's what's shown in the top right hand corner here. You can see there are little letters below each of these small balls. Um, the balls are meant to represent the physical properties of the stars. And so from left to right, it goes M, K, G, F, A, B, O. Um, and so it was later realized that um, Cannon's classification system was uh, a good representation of the underlying physical of structure of the star, although the, the order in which she classified them wound up being a little bit different when you order things by stellar temperature. Um, and so Annie Jump Cannon devised the classification scheme for stars that is still in use today, and that's why her research was so important. So the next historical figure that I want to tell you about today is Dr. Ali Vibert Douglas. She lived from 1894 to 1998. Um, and Vibert Douglas was born in Montreal in, in 1894, and both of her parents died young, so she lived in England with her grandmother and her brother. Um, she returned to Montreal in 1904 at, to attend the Westmount Academy, and she was very interested in science, but considered her gender a handicap. So, for example, she was refused admit, admission to the science club because she was a girl, and so she listened in at the door because her, um, her brother left the door ajar. So she realized that if she sat in the hallway, she could still listen in on the conversation despite being not, not being allowed in the room. Um, so she graduated at the top of her class from Westmount Academy and won an award to go to, or a scholarship to go to McGill. So she started her studies in, at McGill in 1912, but was interrupted by the First World War, where she moved back to London and she worked at the War Office as a statistician and was decorated by the British government for that effort. She returned to McGill and obtained a bachelor's degree in 1919 and a PhD in 1926. Um, so Vibert Douglas was the um, first PhD in astrophysics awarded um, at, the, at McGill University and in fact within the province of Quebec. She's one of the first women in North America to earn the degree, and she's the first female Canadian astrophysicist. So she remained at McGill for another 14 years and then moved to Queen's University in 1939 to become the Dean of Women, where she held, she held that post until 1958. And she also became a professor of astronomy until her retirement in 1964. Um, Vibert Douglas made important contributions to the Amateur Society of, um, of Astronomers in Canada, so the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. She served as its president from 1943 to 1944, and she also funded the, founded the Kingston chapter of the Royal Astronomical Society in 1961. And for those, these efforts and more, she was awarded, an, or she was, became an officer of the Order of Canada in 1967. So Ali Vibert Douglas, Douglas researched stars, um, and in particular the Stark effect in hot stars, so that's the shifting of spectral lines caused by an electric field. Um, and equally important, or perhaps more important to her research, was her impact in getting women accepted into engineering and medicine programs. So at the time, Queen's, Queen's was at the time and still is a major research institution in Canada. 
Um, and as Dean of Women, uh, Vibert Douglas had important influence into um, getting women into those programs and getting them the education they needed to, to have careers in those fields. Um, and as we've seen previously, that, that was very difficult at that, at that time. So moving on to uh, a slightly later career, um, so Dr. Helen Sawyer Hogg is a Canadian or was a Canadian astrophysicist. She lived from 1905 to 1993. Um, so she was born in Massachusetts in 1905 and attended uh, Mount Holyoke Women's College in Massachusetts. And very late in her degree in chemistry, she changed uh, from chemistry to astronomy because she came, became fascinated by the stars. Um, and part of this came from a class trip to see an eclipse in 1925, and she was also visited by Annie Jump Cannon, um, who encouraged uh, the class to pursue research in astronomy. And if you'll recall, we, we've already talked about uh, it Cannon today. Um, so she got a fellowship to study at Harvard College in the fall of 1926. She measured the sizes of star clusters called globular clusters, and she published, published several papers. Um, but she was actually awarded her PhD from Radcliffe College. So this was the women's college next to Harvard, again, because women uh, couldn't be awarded degrees at Harvard at the time. So Hogg spent a lot of her early career photographing variable stars in star clusters as an unpaid assistant to her husband, first in Victoria and then in Toronto. And this was because women couldn't be offered or weren't offered jobs in observatories at the time. Um, she was also one of the first female astronomers to travel the world and carry out research, and this would have been in the 1930s. So she eventually did take on a formal position in teaching duties at the University of Toronto, um, and that was because a lot of the male staff were away during World War II. Um, she retained her position after they returned and continued to make important contributions in globular clusters um, uh, during the time that she was at uh, the University of Toronto. Um, she was the founding president of the Canadian Astronomical Society that we'll talk about later on today. She was an officer of the Order of Canada, and she was also awarded the Stanford Fleming Award. So Helen Sawyer Hogg's research contribution to astronomy was on her impact on globular cluster research and on how that impacted our understanding of the universe at the time. So Helen Sawyer Hogg looked for variable stars in globular clusters and variable stars have the same peak luminosity. So if you study them carefully, you can get a sense of how far away they are. And so in this way, Hogg was able to um, determine how far away the globular clusters that she was seeing on her photographic plates were. And that allowed her to make some of the first estimates of the size and the mass and the structure of the Milky Way, which were really novel concepts at the time. Her other important contribution to Canadian astronomy in particular is that she popularized astronomy in Canada. She wrote a column for the Toronto Star for 30 years called With the Stars, and she also wrote a book in 1976 called The Stars Belong to Everyone. Um, so a lot of the, um, a good fraction of the Canadian Astronomical Society, the professional Canadian Astronomical Society in particular, um, owes its beginnings to Helen Sawyer Hogg. And so the last historical figure in astronomy that we'll talk about today is Vera Rubin. So Vera lived from 1928 to 2016. Um, so she um, obtained her uh, bachelor degree from Vassar College, which was a, a women's college at the time in 1948, and Vassar is in New York. Um, and then she got a PhD from Georgetown in 1954, which was the only college in Washington, D.C., which uh, afforded PhDs or gave PhDs to women. Um, and she wound up getting that PhD despite considerable barriers for women and mothers at the time. So she tried to enroll in Princeton um, and was barred from entry in 1948 because she was a woman. And in fact, Princeton wouldn't allow women into its program for another 27 years. Um, she enrolled at Cornell in 19, uh, and obtained a master's degree in 1951, studying the, the motion of galaxies in, uh, in and near clusters. Um, the work proved to be fairly controversial at the time. Um, and she also had to fight for recognition in the field um, because she had a young family and was pregnant during some of her degree. So in particular, um, she had to fight to present her work at the American Astronomical Society um, in the early 1950s because of her pregnancy. And so eventually wound up at uh, leaving Cornell and enrolling in Georgetown. Um, so because this early work on galaxy clusters proved to be controversial, she turned to measuring the, inter the internal dynamics of galaxies in the early 1970s um, and thinking that this would be a much less controversial field to enter. Um, she was a researcher at the Carnegie Institution until her death, and she was elected to the National Academy of Science. She obtained the National Medal of Science and the Gruber International Cosmology Prize, among many other recognitions.
And so um, Vera Rubin's contribution to astronomy is that she measured the rotation speeds of gas clouds in galaxies. And um, that's what's illustrated in this picture here is a plot of the rotational velocity on the y-axis as a function of the distance of those clouds from the x-axis. And around the time that Vera, Vera did her research, um, the spectrographs became sensitive enough that she could measure the rotation speeds of gas clouds in the outskirts of galaxies for, first time, for the first time. And what was predicted is that those, the motion of those gas clouds would decrease as one increased or got farther away from the galaxy center because the, the force of gravity gets weaker as you get, away, get farther away from the galaxy. But instead what she found is that the rotation curves or the orbital speeds of galaxies are, are basically flat as a function of radius. And the implication, and, and uh, Rubin carried out some of the early calculations to that effect, is, or one of the implications is that there is a lot of dark matter in nearby galaxies. And in fact, the, the, light, uh, the light parts of galaxies, the gas and the stars, represent only a small fraction of what we can actually see. And so Rubin's measurements provided some of the first convincing evidence for dark matter, and which underpins all of modern cosmology. So let's move on now from a historical look at um, some of the uh, important women researchers in astronomy in the past um, to talk about the, the, state of, um, uh, the, the state of the field today and in, importantly some factors to consider when thinking about um, underrepresentation in astronomy, in particular in the experience of women in astronomy. So we'll move on to the second part of our outline and I'll talk about conscious and unconscious bias. Um, so an obvious factor in um, research, early research by women in astronomy, and this was sort of the, the undertone of a lot of the case studies that I just described to you, is this notion of conscious bias or discrimination. And so I've pulled this definition from Wikipedia, but discrimination is simply the unjust or prejudicial treatment of different categories of people um, or things, especially on the grounds of race or age or sex. Um, and discrimination was very common, particularly in the, the first part of the 20th century. And so I've pulled here an ad um, for a, this is from a fast food chain called Hardee's in the US. Um, and for people who can't quite read it, um, you can blow it up. But basically it, it, it says that, uh, you, you know, women don't leave the kitchen. We all know a woman's place is in the home. And this is a, a fairly common view in the, in the early part of the 20th century in particular. And as I've described in some of the individual case studies that I've talked about, institutionalized discrimination against women and others in academia was common until at least the 1970s. And so this was certainly a, pa a factor at play in the past. So it, it is true that conscious bias or discrimination is much less acceptable or common now, and it certainly isn't institutionalized, but I, I felt the need to bring up that it, it does still happen. Um, and so there are two quotes here that are fairly recent. Um, by fairly uh, popular or, or famous people in the field of physics. So the first reads as follows, let me tell you about my trouble with girls. These three things happen when they're in my lab. You fall in love with them, they fall in love with you, and when you criticize them, they cry. So this is a statement made in 2015 by Dr. Tim Hunt. He's the Nobel laureate in 2001 for medicine. Um, and then finally, one from uh, even more recently, this is by Dr. Alessandro Strumia. The quote is, physics was invented and built by men. It's not by invitation. And this was at a talk given um, at the CERN Particle Accelerator. Um, and Strumia is a, a senior professor at the, in the Department of Physics at the University of Pisa. Um, and, and so the, the reason why I, I bring these things up first is, is first to, to mention that they still happen. A, a talk like this wouldn't be complete without that acknowledgement. Um, but also to emphasize how unacceptable those, um, uh, those kinds of statements are today. So in particular, in response to the comments by Alessandro Strumia from a couple of months ago, um, a website went out called Particles for Justice. Um, so it's a really nice discussion of why those kinds of comments are damaging, but more importantly, they're simply incorrect. Um, and so this, it was formally a statement by the high energy physics community. Um, a lot of astronomers signed on to this statement, um, both because it, um, that they believe in its contents, um, but also because there's a, an, a, a relatively new marriage between particle physics and astrophysics um, professionally, and that's because there are a lot of the models to explain the dark matter in the universe come from the model of, or extensions to the standard model of particle physics. Um, and so, um, 
there's a, a kinship in particular between the high energy physics community and the astrophysics community, which resulted in um, th this statement having some impact in the astronomy community in Canada in particular. So there's, there's conscious bias, um, and it's certainly uh, less common today than in the past and um, uh, less acceptable today than in the past. Um, but it's recent research is um, also coming to appreciate the importance of a phenomenon called un unconscious bias or implicit cognition and its impact in astronomy research. So implicit cognition, again, pulling from Wikipedia, they're the set of unconscious influences such as knowledge or perception or memory that influence a person's behavior, even though they themselves have no conscious awareness whatsoever of those influences. So there are unconscious influences on one's decisions that often have nothing to do with the factors um, that, that someone is consciously basing their, um, their decisions uh, on. Um, and so studies show that many professionals are unconsciously biased against women in particular. And so there's an example here on the bottom left. I've cut and pasted two identical resumes from that, that I pulled from the interweb. They're identical except for the name at the top of the resume. The one on the left says John Garcia and the one on the right says Jane Garcia. And there have never now been several controlled studies that give a set of researchers the same uh, resumes except for the name at the top. And the resumes whose name at the top is female are consistently rated worse than the resumes whose name at the top are male. In other words, identical resumes are ranked differently depending on the applicant's name. And it's worth noting that the um, inferred or perceived ethnicity of that name also has an impact on the um, people's judgment of the quality of the resume. So in other words, people are making judgment about the aptitudes of a, of a potential applicant unconsciously based on, uh, on a demographic that should have nothing to do with the merit of the candidate. Um, so this is a relatively new field of study, um, certainly compared to conscious bias. There's an excellent body of research that's available out there to dis um, that, that uh, for anyone who wants to take a look. Um, I'd recommend going to Project Implicit. This is a site maintained uh, by Harvard University. It has a, a nice explanation of implicit cognition, as well as a bunch of different links to some studies. Um, the important notes, the important things to note about implicit cognition is, is first of all, that, that, it, that it's implicit. People are doing this without uh, realizing that that's what they're doing. Um, and in, secondly, that implicit cognition itself appears to um, cross uh, gender and ethnicity barriers. In other words, women are just as unconsciously biased against women as men are. Um, and um, so therefore, simply increasing the number of women on committees or in universities or in companies for that matter, doesn't counteract the effect of unconscious bias. So why is all of this relevant and how might this be related to um, uh, research in astronomy? And the reason why, or one of the reasons why they may be related is this concept of peer review. Um, so science runs on peer review. And for people who haven't heard of that concept before, it's basically the evaluation of work by one or more people with similar skills to the, pro to the producers of that work. And in astronomy, peer review is used for almost all aspects of astronomical research. Um, we use it to evaluate the scientific merit of journal articles, of grant applications, of facility access requests, and award applications. And so basically what happens is illustrated on the bottom of this slide. So someone submits a proposal to do something awesome in astronomy, and that proposal is sent to a committee of peers. So they're, they're typically professors from other institutions. And that, that um, uh, ensemble of professors decides how meritorious the application is. And if the committee of professors decides that the proposal has scientific merit, then, it is, uh, then the proposal is accepted and either observing time is given or funding is granted um, or the journal article is accepted. And so the idea here is that if there's bias in this peer review process, that can impact many aspects of astronomy research from observations to um, uh, grant applications to the publication of journal articles. So one way in which bias might creep into the peer review process is through access to telescope time. And so one of the, the studies that, that I was involved in in recent years involved studying the impact of um, gender on the allocation of telescope time for Canadian telescopes. So access to the Canadian share of research class optical telescope observing time is allocated through peer review. So what I'm showing here is a picture of the summit of Mauna Kea 
In the foreground is one of the, the Gemini telescopes, and in the, oh, I should point here with my green pointer. So um, this telescope here is the Gemini, one of the Gemini facilities, and this telescope here is the Canada France Hawaii telescope. So Canada owns shares of the time in those on those telescopes, and that time is allocated to um, Canadian researchers based on merit using peer review. And so what we wanted to find out was whether or not that peer review process was biased in some way. And so the way the peer review process works is that a group of professors or several groups of professors evaluate proposals based on their scientific merit. And generally the proposer's name, so the researcher that's submitting the application for time is known to the peer review group. And the um, proposals that are given the lowest score on a system, on a ranking system from one to five are allocated time. And so the proposals that have the lowest scores um, in that number one is the best tend to get preferential access to the telescope. And so what we did in recent years was we looked at the average scores that proposals obtain um, and broke that down to whether the proposer was a man or was a woman. And so that's what the, the plot here is showing. So the y-axis shows the mean scores that were obtained by proposers, depending on whether they're men, which is shown in uh, orange, sorry, um, and women, shown here in blue. And keep in mind that lower scores are better. So we want, one wants these histograms to be as low as possible to maximize access to the telescope. And we broke the sample that we had of about 750 applications um, into two subgroups. So one were applicants uh, who were professors, and one um, broke them into, or, or a second subgroup were applicants who were researchers. And um, what you can see for people who, um, who, who understand the, the statistical jargon here, we ran some statistical tests to try and figure out whether the differences that we see between the proposal scores for men and for women are statistically significant. And in most cases, they are. And so the takeaway message here is that male astronomers are more likely to win Canadian telescope time than female astronomers. So even though the peer review process is, is, should be based solely on scientific merit, the gender of the proposal, proposers appears to matter. And it's worth pointing out here that this is true for all telescope time allocation processes that have been studied around the world so far. So this isn't unique to the Canadian process. In fact, all mechanisms that people have come up with so far um, have generated this kind of this kind of result. So now having reviewed conscious and unconscious bias as a backdrop for Canadian astronomy, let's look at the numbers. So the Canadian Astronomical Society has carried out some surveys um, just this year. And the first one it carried out was a demographic survey. So it looked at all of the current members of the Canadian Astronomical Society. So again, these are professional astronomers who are members of the society in Canada. And that reflects a good fraction of the professional astronomers in the country as a whole. Um, and uh, from that membership, um, the, uh, the society used a, a binary determinant. They assessed whether um, the member was most likely to be a man or a woman based on their name. So we actually used a statistical program developed at the University of Montreal um, that, that assesses a likelihood based on a first name that someone is either male or female. Um, so we certainly recognize that this isn't the ideal way to determine uh, whether someone is male or female, nor is it a very complete way to assess gender. Gender is a much more sophisticated uh, concept than, than simply men and women, um, but this is the best we could do with the data that we had available. And so these three pie charts show the fraction of women um, at various stages of their career um, in, uh, who are members of the Canadian Astronomical Society. So the pie chart on the left shows that about 39% of the women who are graduate students in the Canadian Astronomical Society, or about 39% of the graduate students within the Canadian Astronomical Society are, are women. The middle pie chart shows that about 29% of early career researchers, so for people who are familiar with postdoctoral fellows, that's what these, these people largely are. About 29% or almost uh, a little less than a third of them in Canada are women. And then once we move to professors, about 21% of women in Canada are, um, or of the astronomers in Canada are women. Um, and that fraction decreases if you consider the stage at which um, the, the stage of the professor. In other words, there are proportionately fewer full professors than there are assistant and associate professors in Canada. Um, and so uh, one of the things that, that we can see from these pie charts is that as you go to higher and higher ranks within the professional within professional astronomy, 
the fraction of women are, is lower and lower. So fewer women rise through the professional ranks relatively to men. Um, and given the, the history of astronomy that we just talked about, the fact that um, uh, conscious bias was uh, prevalent in astronomy until relatively recently, that might not be surprising. In other words, the women that are full professors now may have experienced conscious bias or a very different environment when they were younger than the graduate students of today. So maybe there's a temporal effect happening here. Um, the studies that have looked at this have shown that the decrease in the fraction of women at various stages in academia can't solely be explained by changes in the um, by, by changes in the, the climate of those professional institutions over the years. And so it appears as though there's something on something going on here. And so for people who have heard of the term a leaky pipeline, um, this is an, one illustration of that fact that for one reason or another, there tend to be fewer women at the higher ranks in academia and in astronomy in particular than at the lower ranks. So the Canadian Astronomical Society also carried out a climate survey in 2018, and this is just a word cloud that represents the, the responses to, um, to that survey. So this was an anonymous uh, voluntary survey that looked at the climate of someone's workplace, so how happy and how safe um, that people were perceived to be. Um, and the takeaway message, we're still analyzing this data, but the takeaway message is that women are more likely to experience a negative workplace um, and a negative climate than women are. Uh, or than men are. And so the underlying causes, some of these words might um, help us understand some of the underlying causes. Um, and we're trying to still parse that into some, um, uh, into a format where we can use it to drive policy. So with all of this, this relatively troubling research, one could yeah, ask the question, you know, what are Canadians doing about all of this? Um, because clearly the, the, this points to factors that, that um, lead to a decrease in equity, diversity, and inclusion um, in Canadian astronomy. And so the first point to make is that increasing uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion, sometimes referred to as EDI, is a really complex issue. So if we knew how to solve it, we would. There is no easy solution. In fact, it's not clear the degree to which some of the, um, the statistics that I presented to you are driven by conscious or unconscious bias or some other societal factor that we haven't looked at yet. Um, however, we are taking some steps forward. So here are a few that I've been involved in in the last couple of years. So telescope access proposals, like the ones I described for the CFHT and for Gemini, are now done blindly. In other words, the review panels of those um, proposals now no longer know the gender of the proposer or the identity of the proposer, for, for that matter. And this was an initiative taken by the National Research Council of Canada. Um, the Canadian Astronomical Society has uh, had longstanding support for initiatives that stimulate equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, we're supporters of a number of educational initiatives as well as of conferences that promote um, those kinds of um, uh, th those those kinds of efforts. And um, we're also in the process of developing a clear statement of values as well as a code of conduct um, that uh, clearly lays out what kind of a behavior is acceptable and unacceptable, be it conscious or unconscious, at all of our events. And then finally, we've committed to a regular, systematic, and rigorous uh, approach to taking, taking survey data, so doing both demographic data as well as climate surveys. And the idea here is that un unless we keep statistics on how the, the population is changing, it's going to be really difficult to assess whether or not some of the approaches that we're taking are, um, are changing the statistics uh, as they relate to equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, so the point here is that, is that there's still lots to do. This is, this is an imperfect science. It's, it's a difficult um, problem to tackle, um, but we are moving forward. And Canada is, is among the countries that, that is uh, being proactive in trying to address some of these issues. So with, with that um, aside, um, and some of those um, uh, less pleasant things to talk about when it comes to women in astronomy, let's go to the third part of the talk. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the present and uh, as well as um, some hope for the future. Um, and so to do that, I'll go back to this montage that Julie made, which um, is, is inspirational in a lot of ways, but instead now of looking at the historical women on this plot, we're going to look at the women who are actively in do, carrying out research in astronomy today. Um, so as I mentioned before, this picture shows only a small fraction of the astronomy research in Canada that's being carried out by women. And of those pictures, I can only pick a few to highlight. And so very quickly, I'll go over just three, and they're shown here. 
Um, and for this part of the talk, last time I went um, chronologically, and this time I'll go alphabetically. Um, so the first person to highlight is Dr. Laura Ferrerese. She's a scientist at the National Research Council of Canada, and she's also uh, cross-appointed at the University of Victoria in British Columbia. She's the interim director of the Gemini Observatory, and she's vice president of the International Astronomical Union. That's the largest organization of professional astronomers in the world. Um, she's the recipient of the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal, the Hogg Lectureship, and the Martin Award. Um, and her research expertise and the reason for um, her, all of her awards comes from um, her work on supermassive black holes. So below Laura's picture, there are two um, little, well, there, are, there are two images. The one on the left shows a, in a, a blow up of the central region of a galaxy where we think the supermassive black hole lies. So we're relatively sure that almost all galaxies, or pretty much all galaxies, have um, supermassive black holes. So these are black holes that have masses of tens of millions of times um, the mass of the sun. And what Laura discovered using mainly the Hubble Space Telescope, which is shown on the right, is that the masses of those black holes scale with the properties, uh, the other properties of the galaxies, in particular the mass of the bulge. And it's now becoming appreciated that other properties like the masses of the disks, as well as of the dark matter halos, correlate with that of the black hole mass. In other words, Laura was one of the first people to discover that the properties of the black holes in galaxies correlate with that in the rest, uh, uh, correlate with the properties of the rest of the galaxies. And that was something that, that wasn't known before until the early 2000s. The next current researcher in astronomy that I'll highlight is Dr. Sarah Gallagher. She's a professor at the university, uh, or at Western University, sorry, that's uh, in Ontario. Um, and she's won several research awards as well as outreach awards in her career. So she was uh, a Ministry of Research and Innovation Early Career Award um, in 2010. And she's also won um, Western University faculty outreach as well as faculty research scholarships uh, throughout the, the 2010s. Um, and more recently, she was named the first ever science advisor to the Canadian Space Agency. So this just happened a couple of months ago. And Dr. S uh, Gallagher's research expertise is in the field of galaxy evolution. So she's an expert in active galactic nuclei, which is the picture that's shown here on the left. So the process by which material funnels into the supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy. And we think that that process emits, um, uh, is an important source of energy for the galaxy itself. There, um, the energy that's emitted during that process, the so-called feedback, is thought to help regulate galaxy evolution. Um, and um, some of Sarah's research is, is uh, illuminating exactly how that process happens. And then the picture on the right shows a, a compact groups of, group of galaxies, which is another field in which um, Dr. Gallagher has made some contributions. So these are very compact galaxies where um, the interactions between them govern their evolution. Um, and exactly how that affects star formation as well as their physical properties has been a, a research interest of Dr. Gallagher's as well. And then the final Canadian, female Canadian astronomer that I'll highlight is Dr. Vicki Caspi. She's a professor at McGill University in Quebec. Um, she's one of the most prolific and influential astrophysics researchers in Canada today, male or female. Her research has been widely recognized by a number of medals, um, including the Herzberg Medal, the, Rutter the Rutherford Medal. They're almost too, um, too numerous to name. She was made recently a companion of the Order of Canada. And her research expertise is in neutron stars. And so some of her early research um, focused on the neutron star or the pulsar in the center of the Crab Nebula, and that's the picture that's shown here on the left. And so the timing of the Crab Pulsar allowed um, Dr. Caspi to determine that the, the pulsar was at the very center of the nebula in which it is found, and that increased the, the correspondence between um, or, or led to the widely accepted theory that neutron stars were the remnants of supernova. And in fact, this particular supernova was observed in the, uh, by the Chinese uh, in 1054. Um, and uh, Dr. Caspi's research helped pinpoint the neutron star as the remnant of that explosion. Um, and Dr. Caspi's research has also uh, helped elucidate the physics of neutron stars. And that's what's illustrated by the picture here on the right. So this is a cartoon, an artist's conception of, of a neutron star that, um, that's emitting some radiation and responding to its magnetic field. Um, and so uh, Vicky Caspi is one of the preeminent neutron star researchers in the world. So I use this montage by Julie as a, a launching point to talk about many different uh, women in astronomy in Canada in the past as well as in the present. We talked a little bit about the factors that influence their or have influenced their careers. 
Um, and so uh, in closing, there, there are three things that I'd like you to take away from this webinar. First is that historically, women have made important contributions to astronomy research, and often their accomplishments weren't acknowledged, at least at the time. There are a variety of complex factors that underlie um, the experiences of women and, and other represented groups in astronomy. So we talked about both conscious and unconscious bias. These likely affects, affect equity, diversity, and inclusivity in Canadian astronomy. Um, this is a complex issue that, and efforts are underway to address it. And then finally, there's a, there's a fabulous community of world-renowned female astronomers in Canada right now. The future is, is very bright. Um, and um, the, the, the hope is that um, the, there will be less and less underrepresentation of women as well as other underrepresented groups in astronomy moving forward. Um, and uh, that the, the community will be able to recognize their efforts at the, time, at the time they're made along with all the rest of the astronomers in Canada. So with that, I'll end there and take any questions. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Christine. Um, this is actually has been super interesting. I knew quite a bit, but I've learned a lot as well. And I think the recent, um, I mean, you had some data from 2018, so that's very interesting as well for everyone. Um, as we're, I mean, we have just a few minutes left, but if some of you have questions, please type them in the chat. Um, we'll be happy to, I think Christine will be happy to answer them. So before we all leave, if you have questions, um, please go ahead and um, type them in the chat. I know, unfortunately, we couldn't see Christine for some reason. The webcam didn't cooperate this time. <laughs> it worked last time, unfortunately, but I hope you enjoyed the, the talk and I thought it was, um, it was very interesting. Um, just so you know as well, she didn't mention it, but Christine is right there in the montage as well. <laughs> so I'm waiting to see if some of you are, will be uh, asking questions. Yeah, I see some of you are, some of the questions are coming. Um, oh, I had a question I wanted to ask me and I completely forgot. So anyway, <laughs> sorry, I, now that I'm here, I completely forgot. So let's just wait for people to type their questions. So Christine, I don't know if you saw it, but there's one that just appeared. Yep. Um, so uh, the question is, how do you encourage young students to enter the field of astronomy? Um, so I think astronomy is a, um, uh, some people call it a, a gateway science in the sense that it's a, um, it, 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 looking up in the sky and wondering what it contains and how it can be explained. Um, is something that, that people of all ages do. And at the same time, astronomy is a field that relies on lots of, um, lots of skills ranging from uh, math to engineering to, to other fields of science to chemistry, um, let alone physics. Um, and so there are lots of ways that, chemist, that, that astronomy connects to the, the um, K-12 curriculum in particular. Um, so encouraging students to enter the field of astronomy, allowing them to ask uh, simple questions and providing the answer, um, making, making it clear that um, uh, simple questions can be very profound, um, and answering simple questions or questions from young astronomers um, uh, respectfully and, and um, providing them um, some information about how to take the next steps would be, would be good ways to, to encourage um, young students to enter the field of astronomy. Um, I think the role of mentors is also important. So there, there's lots of research, and some of you may have done this in your class, but if you ask the average child to draw what a scientist look like, looks like, um, they tend to draw a very stereotypical view of what that is. Um, and so sometimes um, seeing, um, given, being given clear evidence that there, that there are people who look like them or who talk like them or who, um, are the same gender as them who do this kind of thing can be a real motivator. Historically, it certainly was for some of the women that we talked about. Um, but I think those are mentorship is, is another important way to encourage people to, to take up astronomy and or any science they, um, they, they wish to pursue. Yeah, um, do you want me yeah, to take this question, please. Judy, yep. the, the one from uh, Terry? Um, okay, so the question is, how many instances of harassment are known about for Canadian astronomy conferences? Um, so this is a, a difficult question for me to answer, but I'll answer it to the, to the best of my knowledge. So 
Um, in particular, I'll answer it um, for um, uh, conferences, uh, the annual general meetings of the Canadian Astronomical Society, which is the, are the subset of meetings held in Canada every year for which we do have data. Um, and we recently did a climate survey that asked um, respondents to um, describe instances of harassment at various parts, uh, in, in various, um, uh, various aspects of their workplace in the last five years. Um, and specifically at conferences of the respondents, um, the, the number was a handful. Um, it, it, exact parsing that data is difficult. The reason being that it's a voluntary anonymous survey and so exactly what that says about the state of astronomy uh, quali quantitatively is difficult to assess. Um, however, it is clear that these incidents are happening, although they're relatively small in number compared to the number of respondents. So to give you a sense of percentage, it's something like 5% um, responded about incidents of harassment in uh, Canadian astronomy conferences in particular. Um. I still don't remember the question I had, but um, I just wanted to highlight that, and I know many of you are teachers, I know many of you are informal educators as well in different cent centers, actually we have quite a few here from Edmonton and Royal, um, uh, sorry, RMRC, Royal Community College, sorry, I was confused with the one of the museums. Anyway, um, the, um, yeah, I was confused with the ROM, so sorry, I'm forgetting what I want to say. <laughs> Again, but yes, I want to say that I think showing, um, I think in many, uh, showing examples and showing role models, I think that would be great. Um, if you are teachers, for example, if you talk about astronomy in Canada, then, or astronomy in general, it's great to highlight some of the women working in the field today. And I will continue this montage. Actually, I want to keep adding more and more faces to it. And hopefully, eventually, I'll put a link to some of these, put links to some of these women so that you have people you can refer to maybe in your own province, for example, because I think it's great for people to see that, like like Christine said, many very often people will draw a scientist as being an older man, for example, but it's nice to see that there are women, there are many different styles of, of scientists, including younger women, for example. We are over the hour, I just noticed that, uh, so unless you, some of you have very final questions, I know many of you are still online, so maybe you're just waiting to see if other people have questions, uh, but if you do have questions, please type them right now. Otherwise, uh, we will um, end the recording here and say goodbye to everyone. But as we're just waiting to see if other people are typing, I just want to thank Christine again for accepting to do this talk, do this research. You had a lot of information that, to share. That, that was uh, incredible. Thank you very much. Well, thanks to everybody for tuning in. If you do have questions that, that come up to you after you log off, um, I'm eminently Googleable. Um, so look me up and fire me an email. If I don't know the answer, I will do my best to try and find it and get back to you. Thanks again. Also, so thanks everyone for watching, watching till the end and hopefully we'll see you in our next webinars.